Corey for joining today and thanks tons to all of you out in ESA world. Um, as Megan said, loyal ESA fan and member, I love getting my Eco Log Digest every day. I can't help but look at it. And so I really appreciate the work you guys are doing. And I hope that what we present today will be useful to you. Um, I'm gonna be going over a number of papers and projects that have used land fire data and talking about those some and hopefully inspiring you and welcoming you to contact us in Landfire to help you with your spatial data needs. All right, so here we go. Here's our agenda for today. I'm gonna to describe who we are. I'm going to give a really broad and quick overview of Landfire. I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, which is Landfire and students. Um, tons of students are out there using Landfire data and innovating and learning and teaching us, um, of course. Going to go over some example papers, as I mentioned, and then give you just a quick idea of what you might do next if you are new to Landfire, have a little bit of experience, or are a veteran with Landfire. Okay, who are we? First, Landfire. First and foremost, I should say, Landfire is people, many of them. I'll be talking about pixels, models, GIS, all that stuff, but it's powered by people. Um, officially, Landfire is a partnership between the U.S. Department of Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Service. Today, you'll be seeing the Nature Conservancy folks. We have a cooperative agreement to do outreach, to help users, to um, do landscape work. But we couldn't do any of this without the production folks in Landfire. And they're not here today. They're busy making Landfire better. So shout out to them. And I just want to make it clear that while we're happy to represent Landfire, we are not all of Landfire. There's tons of people doing amazing work. And so shout out to them. All right. So I mentioned the Nature Conservancy's Landfire team. We range from Jim Smith down in Jacksonville, Florida, all the way to Corey who's in Bend, Oregon, and she's with us today. She'll be happy to help field questions. She brings a lot of expertise. Our team has expertise in forest biometrics, remote sensing, GIS, state and transition modeling. I've done some mycorrhizal work. Um, Megan, who's with us today, is a wildlife ecologist plus a communication specialist. So um, we can help you with a lot of different topics. We're not just pixel pushers at all. We love conservation. Love data, love research, and I wanna connect with you over all of that. Okay, a brief overview of this thing called Landfire. Okay, Landfire labels over 9 billion pixels, and that's just in the United States alone with over two dozen attributes. More about that. So Landfire um, established in 2004, to characterize vegetation, fire, and fuel characteristics for all lands in the United States, plus the insular areas like Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, we update the data regular, regularly, and um, we're gonna have an update soon. So we're getting faster and faster up at updating data and having less time between the updates. I'll talk about versions a little more later, but I wanted to just point out that Landfire is all lands. We deliver spatial data that's at 30 meter resolution. So the pixel size or the cell size is 30 meters for the spatial data. And we update it regularly. I said it better that time. Getting warmed up here. All right, so I mentioned that Landfire delivers dozens of data sets. Here are a few. All right, now I've categorized them as fire and fuel, vegetation and disturbance, but this is not all by any means. Under the fire and fuel products, we deliver surface fuel, canopy fuel, um, and those products are used to predict wild and fire behavior and to help prioritize fuels treatments for restoration, for protecting the wild and urban interface and other values at risk out there. We're called Landfire, but we also very importantly deliver several vegetation data sets. We're not just about fire. Um, we deliver an existing vegetation type data set that I'll be talking about a fair bit today. We map height and cover. We also have a couple different ways to characterize potential vegetation. One is biophysical settings and one is environmental site potential. 
which I'll be talking about both of those as well. Um, those are used in change detection analysis, wildlife habitat modeling, uh, management decisions, tons of different uses for those data sets. Also, I'll be showcasing a couple papers today that relied heavily on land fire disturbance data. We deliver annual disturbance data going back to 1999, for example, and those um, help with mapping disturbance, obviously, um, modeling and evaluation of forest management units, as you'll see in a bit. Another thing that Megan wonderfully reminded me to point out is that we're responsible. Um, as I mentioned, we are people, Lamb Fire is a team of, of folks trying to continuously improve. Um, Inga Lapuma, who is on the Lamp Fire team, um, shares these slides that depict how forest can be covered data sets change from 2014's version to, to the 2016 remap, largely based on user feedback for her area where she lives near the pitch pine ecosystems in New Jersey. Um, so we do try to respond to user feedback. Um, as I mentioned, there's over 9 billion pixels. We can't fix them all. We can't attend to every one of them, every update. But if you can provide us plot information, or if you can provide us some guidance on how to make improvements, we'll try our best. All right, as I mentioned, one of my favorite things to do is to work with students. I'm not in the academic world, but I reach out to students wherever I, whenever I can, and I love to look at the work they're doing through their thesis development, their dissertations, and otherwise. I'm gonna talk about a few of those today. Here's the list of the papers I'm going to mention. Um, just going to go over three of them, plus uh, a non-published project that I've been a part of. If you go to Google Scholar, you'll see dozens of dissertations and other graduate work. It's really amazing what students are doing, um, and you as, as people mentoring and working with students as well, if you're in that role. So first, um, in this paper, um, Jessica used land fire slope and aspect data in her assessment of fire and resilience of forests in Maine. Um, so she used the slope and aspect data. I point that out, it's not fire or vegetation, but it's beautifully produced and mosaic for an entire country. So just another to try to reinforce the point that we're not just about fire, um, for example. Um, I've been super lucky to get to know Keith Phelps. Um, this crossed my desk uh, uh, about a month ago, and Keith used Land Fire's Vegetation Departure Index as an input to his model of fire habitat suitability in Tennessee. Um, this data set helps illuminate structural issues and ecosystems and relies on a Land Fire product I haven't mentioned yet, which are the state and transition models. We have over 900 models and linked documents that capture how our ecosystems looked and functioned prior to European colonization. Those documents and the quantitative outputs of those models provide sort of a baseline that we compare current conditions to to produce this vegetation departure data set. While we or Keith and others are not necessarily saying that historical conditions equals desired future conditions, um, the models in the vegetation departure data do help to provide context and highlight areas in need of ecological management. And here's a map of this. Um, again, a, a beautiful bit of work by Keith Phelps from Clemson University, he just graduated, so shout out to him. Um, and it's cool, he's working with managers there too. It's a very applied project that I'm really, really happy to see him contribute to. Okay, another project was by Dylan Hopkins, who assessed nest site and diet preferences of golden eagles and ferruginous hawks. He used land fire existing vegetation type height and cover data in his modeling to help assess where these um, two raptors would prefer to nest and um, as part of his project. He did a really great job with statistics and GIS, so shout out to Dylan, um, great work on your thesis there at Utah State University. So I run a group of volunteers called the Conservation Data Lab, 
it's just a kind of a ragtag group of students who are oftentimes between things, between undergraduate and graduate work, or they've just graduated and they haven't gotten the real job yet and they want to keep their resume alive. So I've been super lucky to work with them. And one of the projects we've been helping with is assessing vegetation conditions in the Black Hills National Forest. Using land fire data, several land fire data sets are um, the, the statistical computing language and open source GIS software called QGIS, and also a little bit of Art Map, which you guys are probably familiar with, or Art GIS Pro. They have um, basically developed maps and very basic but super illuminating charts of the vegetation of the area. So this chart depicts the top 10 historical ecosystems that would have been in the Black Hills prior to European colonization. So this was produced in R. Um, so yeah, it's a great way to work with students, whether you're in a teaching role, a research role, or just mentoring. You know, it's not that often that I run into students who get to work with millions or billions of pixels. Um, so we can provide that experience for students. Now I'm gonna go into peer reviewed literature that may or may not be by students. I don't always know. Here on this slide, you're gonna see a word cloud where I took titles from roughly 800 papers that cited land fire or, or used land fire, not just cited, but used land fire. And I just made a quick word cloud to represent some of the topics you'll see in the literature. Um, I've seen papers where people modeled the potential impacts of nuclear bombs and use land fire data for the vegetation component of that. Um, I and collaborators published a paper um, mapping potential mycorrhizal communities, um, soil fungi that is, that relate to ecosystems um, using land fire data as the base. So it spans the gamut from model, model, modeling post-fire erosion risk to watersheds to wildlife. Um, it's literally excused the pun, but all over the map with, with the research you guys are doing. Hey, Randy, you said there was 800 papers. Is that in the last couple of years? Like, tell me about the context for that. Um, yeah, so I used, uh, a software called Publisher Parish, which some of you might crack up at. Um, and it basically just mined Google Scholar. Um, and honestly, I don't remember the date range for that. And it's just a subset. Um, we've had some other people look into this and found way more than 800 papers. So I don't remember the actual range of publications that, that 800 encompasses. Um, yeah, it was just a quick snapshot. Um, great question. And also, I will note, I'm not watching the chat or your questions. So Megan, thank you. Um, jump in anytime if there are clarifying questions. Um, paper number one, um, drought sensitivity and trends of riparian vegetation vigor in the Vati USA. This is a paper published um, that looks at riparian area stress in Nevada. And authors, if you're here, please correct me if I get any of this wrong. Um, I'm not a hydrologist, but I really admired the work you did in your paper. From, from my reading, the basic objective of the paper was to first quantitate, quantify vegetation responses to inter, in, interannual variability and drought status, then to isolate and remove that influence to assess trends and vegetation vigor in the riparian areas of Nevada. I probably don't need to say anything about this, but understanding how our riparian areas and water resources respond to drought is critical, especially in the arid states of the Western United States um, where they did their work. Basically, the authors used land fires, existing vegetation type data to delineate the riparian areas in Nevada to constrain, to hone in their work. Um, they weren't assessing all vegetation, just riparian, and they needed a baseline data set for that. This data set represents the current distribution of nature serves ecological systems. So um, I made these maps, the authors made much better figures, but I thought I would make a quick map to show you um, the types that they used in their research. So I took land fires, the existing vegetation type data. And in that data set, there are multiple attributes, right? So you could use a very coarse scale 
um, attribute to map your ecosystems that might say something like coniferous, hardwood, hardwood coniferous, very broad types. So you might go super fine scale where there might be hundreds for a large state like Nevada. Um, so they used a mid scale kind of in between. And <laughs> excuse me, um, the authors used the mid level and you'll see some of the types that they mapped in their work. So what can we learn from their project um, from a land fire perspective? Um, as I mentioned, they used a mid-scale attribute in their work and I believe they picked, I, I'm not the specialist in their area, but it looked appropriate to me. They didn't need the super fine scale attributes that you might need for your work. Um, and they needed something more specific than the courses level. So it clearly indicated that they had done their homework and understanding the attributes. Um, also, the, the authors properly cited land fire. This might sound like a trivial thing to mention, but um, I've looked at a lot of papers over the years and have seen land fire cited improperly. If you're confused about that, reach out to us or just Google land fire citation and you'll get a model for how to do that. So thank you um, authors for that. Also, um, as I mentioned, I'm not a hydrologist, but I was thinking if they had called me, um, they didn't need to, they did totally fine without that. But I like to make it a little more personal. If they had called me, I would have been curious, could they have also brought in some other land fire data sets such as um, canopy cover, which might, in my imagination, influence hydrological or riparian condition in the areas that they were looking at. But great paper, thanks authors for that. Several other authors have done similar things. That is where they use land fire data to help delineate areas for their research. Um, in the first paper, um, Wonka et al. used land fire existing vegetation type data to delineate the non-forested ecosystems. And their research assessing the vulnerability of rangeland ecosystems to state shifts in a changing climate. And I'll note that some of these authors have been amazing contributors to land fire, reviewing models, giving us feedback on, on data. Um, McFarland et al. Um, and th these authors and several authors at Utah State have published a number of papers assessing riparian conditions in Utah and the West and helping to prioritize um, appropriate places to um, you know, locate beaver or to put in um, you know, imitation beaver dams, that sort of thing. So they use land fire data to, rot, to delineate riparian areas and conditions. Bacardi et al. needed to extract appropriate ecosystems and elevations um, from the, the elevation data set for greater sage grouse modeling. Um, and she used the elevation, excuse me, I'm not sure if it's a he or she, used the um, land fire existing vegetation type and the slope data for that. Okay, paper number two. This one caught my eye as being um, a, a fascinating approach technically. Um, and also they really illustrated some really cool uses of land fire data and it was well written. So basically what they wanted to do was to better characterize the patterns of forest management and to, to develop methods to better map roads in the coastal plain and Piedmont regions of the United States. So super large scale, super large area they were working at. The authors used land fire disturbance data to evaluate management unit delineation. So here's a couple of maps from their paper. Um, thank you authors, um, totally borrowed these. Um, Figure number two is basically a map of disturbance intensity, um, an example map from their paper. So they again use land fire annual disturbance data to create this and they stack the data um, to really characterize where there had been thinning, fire, clear cuts, that sort of thing. You'll also note on the right that they, they, they have a map of land cover um, from the ex land fires existing vegetation type data set. And it looks to me that they use the group veg attribute, which may or may not mean much to you, but they use the, the coarser level classification for their legend and mapping here. 
what can we learn from these authors? Um, they did a great job of explaining Lamp Fire. Uh, more and more people seem to understand Lamp Fire, what it is, how to use it. But I, I really appreciate seeing that. And this is the case, whether it's Landfire or other data sets as well. Um, a good description um, really helps me, the, the reader, understand what's going on. They did a great job. They also linked to the data sets, which I appreciated. Um, that I guess that varies from journal to journal, but this journal did allow them to do that. So I could quickly jump and see which data sets they used. Um, they stacked the data sets, which I thought was pretty cool to develop that um, you know, intensity layer. Um, I'm sure people do this all the time um, with other data sets, but disturbance, this was novel to me to see. Um, there are multiple data sets in each group of data sets and most, mul multiple versions of most. So I note this because um, if you go to the disturbance button at landfire.gov, you'll notice that there are multiple disturbance data sets. So, I like what they did. They took the annual disturbance and stacked that together. That may or may not be the approach you would need. So make sure you grab the right data set. It'll save you some time. Also, I was curious if they'd use R or ArcGIS. I was just a bit curious about that. And I also um, would have asked them if we had been able to chat, like how, how, what level of thinning was important to them? So land fires, you might imagine, um, can do a better job at mapping a clear cut versus, um, you know, a timber stand improvement where there's just removal of, of understory or midstory trees um, as a way to open up understory um, structural characteristics. So I would have been really curious about that. And also um, always we're curious about feedback. How well did Landfire do? The disturbance data sets are compiled from change detection technology, you know, looking at remote sensing. We get um, events data from collaborators like you guys from Forest Service, DNR, and we also lean heavily on some of the agency databases and data sets such as the monitoring trends and burn severity. So we do our best to collect all the disturbances and on certain versions we use change detection. So I'm, I was just curious if I've been able to talk to them, if they're here today, I'd love to hear your feedback on our disturbance data. Okay, as you might, you're picking up on the pattern here. Um, I wanted to also just quickly highlight some other papers that did the same thing. The, the authors in the top paper did a very similar thing as the last ones, conceptually at least, where they, they used land fire disturbance and other data sets to locate forest management units to get an understanding of the patterning of things on the landscape. Um, the second authors used several land fire data sets in their accounting of soil carbon in the southeastern United States and disturbance data was one of the inputs for those authors. Then at the bottom, um, a thesis from University of Montana by Tegan Hayes um, looked at disturbances and how they impact mule deer and plant communities and use land fire disturbance data for that. All right, paper number three. I think Corey, thank you. I think Corey um, highlighted this one for us. Modeling species distributions and environmental suitability highlights risk of plant invasions in the Western United States. Um, I really appreciated this data for the topic and for their work. Okay, so the authors aim to model distributions of 15 non-native grasses in the Western United States. Um, many of you probably know this, but wow, these grasses not only displace native species, but can profoundly alter ecosystem processes such as wildfire. While many ecosystems in the United States have a much longer fire return interval today, compared to what we would see historically, um, these grasses can move into a, like a, a sagebrush ecosystem, for example, and greatly shorten the fire return intervals. Um, and that's just one impact of these grasses. The authors use the land fire reference condition database um, to, to, to get identifications of known areas with these invasive species to train their modeling. So, I mentioned this land fire reference conditions database. So land fire, it's key for our work that we get, you know, known places with known things, you know, known canopy cover, known plant species, known fuels. 
to help train our modeling. Um, we're not out looking at every pixel, we have to model this. So the more plots, the more accurate our data. So we have this database that has thousands of plots. The authors used data from that database and also from the Bureau of Land Management's Assessment and Monitoring Inventory Database to, to sort of build a, a training set for their, for their modeling. So it was a really clever approach. And I, I forget how many plots they had, but as you can see, there are a lot of gray dots across the West. We also find areas, um, some places where we don't have as many dots. You know, So if you are looking at this data set, and you're like, oh, I got some data in that area, please let us know. If you have a geo-referenced plot with fire, fuel, vegetation information, we would, would love to talk to you about that. So I think you guys all know this. It's very rare that you get away with um, one data set. Um, these folks had to contend with multiple, like a lot of folks do, and they did a really good job of fitting things together, and they clearly understood what they were doing with the databases. They were super transparent about their decisions when there were overlaps or issues they had to reconcile. So um, really amazing work. Um, if they had called Maybe, me... Uh Devin's on the, Devin, the lead author is on the webinar today. So I don't want to put any pressure on anybody, but if anybody feels like chiming in, feel free. So go ahead. If they had called you, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. <laughs> right, right. Hi, Devin. Thank you for your work. And yeah, definitely um, shout out. Thank you. And call me if you want, but you did an amazing job without calling me as, as everyone seems to do. So I'd um, love to hear from you. Anyways, um, I was curious about um, the, um, possibly using some land fire techniques for evaluation. So the authors did an amazing job of evaluating their models. It looked very thorough and robust to me. One thing land fire does is that we hold out plots, right? So we have our thousands and thousands of plots um, that we mine for our modeling. We hold out some, we do the modeling, then we compare our model results to those holdout plots. And um, the authors may have done that and I missed it, I, but I thought, wow, that might be cool to try. And then we can learn from these authors for sure on model val validation. So um, thanks for that. Great, great work. Um, a few other authors have done similar things in using the, the reference condition database. Uh, Reeves, et al. Reeves et al. did something that I hadn't seen before in a recent paper, 2020. Um, where he, he took the Landfire existing vegetation type data um, that maps an ecosystem for every 30 meter pixel. Then he took the reference condition database, which has species, and then tried to predict the most dominant species for those existing vegetation types for locations across the West where he and co-authors were modeling non-forced carbon stocks. So super interesting work. Um, the authors of the second paper um, used over 21,000 plot points from the re reference condition database and model training, similar to the authors of the highlighted paper. And Hamilton et al., um, they did not use the reference condition database directly from what I could tell, but they, they did note how the reference condition database works in terms of land fire. So I wanted to shout them out uh, because it was really cool to see how they described land fire and how the data sets were developed and that they referenced this database. Um, I don't see that very often. So it just kind of added to the body of knowledge that's out there. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for your patience. As I went those papers, I hope they were inspiring, useful. I know they were to me. Um, I mentioned versions. Land fire has several versions out there and a couple things about this. Um, you should familiarize yourself with them. There are links that Megan will send to help you understand what changed between versions and kind of how they work. Um, Lampfire is not static at all. We aim to be consistent, but we also aim to improve, which is a constant balancing act. But we don't want to use 2005 technology and techniques to map today's fires, fuels, and vegetation. So Things change between versions, partly because conditions on the ground change, but there can be some methodological shifts. So if you are using multiple versions 
for maybe time series, or you just want to compare through time, be aware that methods may change. And um, some of the change you may see may not be due to changes on the ground. So it's, it's, a, it's a result of improvement, which I think is a good thing. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. And um, we'll have contact information later if you want more information on how versions change. Also, there's some documents, as I mentioned, that, that really go into detail for some of the data sets, how they've changed over time and how you might interpret changes. All right, so now what? Um, I want to invite you to contact us. We, we love working with folks. Um, we love nothing more than getting a call or to have a Zoom and discuss research projects or collaborations um, that we can participate in so we can keep relevant and contribute to your work. Um, if you're brand new to Landfire, reach out to Megan to get on the newsletter list. She sends out a really short newsletter postcard um, that usually has updates and uh, some cool stories. Maybe we could feature your work on one. Um, also, I would say grab a beverage and peruse landfire.gov. Um, it's, it's a very deep website. I have a lot of respect for the people who put it together because it's so much information to convey. Um, it's, Landfire has been around a long time. So I would spend some time there. And especially if you go to landfire.gov, you're gonna see circles on the top that, that categorize the products. Click on those and start drilling down for, your, for fun. So if you have some experience, um, but you wouldn't consider yourself a veteran, um, I'd really like to hear from you how well Lampfire worked or didn't work. Um, how can we improve, whether it's from finding the data I've heard from some students, especially who get stuck with doing a lot of the GIS, it seems like they didn't find the data. We had made it clear enough on the website. Um, so we love getting that feedback so we can improve. Also, um, do you have plots to share? Are you aware of the state and transition models that um, we, we like to use to assess management scenarios? We use it in te them in teaching. Um, maybe you wanna take your land fire knowledge to the next level by digging into the state and transition models. Expert, or even if not, help us teach the next, next generation about best practices with data, GIS techniques, and science communications. And share your lessons learned with us. Uh, we'd really like to hear from you. And with that, uh, a huge thank you to you for um, contributing your time today, being here, listening. And with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see the question pane and see you. Andy, um, I'm gonna put in a plug yeah. um, while you're doing that for our informal open office hour. So the last Thursday of every month, um, we take an hour, we grab a cup of coffee and we talk about land fire. So um, if that's of interest to you and you wanna pop in um, just for five minutes or 10 minutes and see what we're talking about, this month we'll be talking about the land fire reference database and many of these papers that Randy just talked about um, use the reference database. So um, please join us the last Thursday of the month. Um, and I just put the link in there so you can go ahead and, and check that out. So we did have a question. Um, from Devin and I think probably other folks on the call might have this as well. And it, it touched, you touched on it with um, the reference, um, how to, I'm sorry, how to cite land fire. So a reoccurring question, um, is there a standard citation guide for the land fire products? Um, this person has spent time clicking around the website. I put the link in the, um, Q&A window, but I might just put that back in the chat window. But if you could, do you want to say anything more about that, Randy? Or um, I don't know if I have tons more to say about that other than um, I really wish that we knew, you know, or could tell you the people that produce the data sets. Um, you know, we don't, we don't tag names with the data sets, even though we'd love to give them credit. Um, I think what Megan put in the chat is probably as good as anything. Um, for citing Lampfire, and thanks for asking that. And if there's any confusion, even if you look over the citation page that Megan put, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm just. I might be repeating it again. I haven't watched the chat, but I, I put the the Lampfire.gov link in the chat. 
That was the same one, yeah. Okay, I figured, but I can't see what you've done. Any other questions, ideas, feedback? I, don't, I only saw one other author of the paper that we featured on there, but maybe there's, if there's anybody else that wants to chime in or contributors to any of these papers we talked about, there was quite a few, um, but we're definitely interested in hearing, like Randy said, feedback from you all and, um, you know, looking to improve and build upon these products and data sets over time. It's funny, I imagine if we were at an Ecological Society of America conference, there might be a cacophony of questions and challenges and ideas. At least that's what I remember from back in the day being in person. Well, I don't know, John, what do you think? Can you hear me? I don't know. I can't. Yes. Okay, good. It's like my controls are like basically all either black or white right now. I'm not sure which, which way is up. Um, uh oh. Yeah, no, folks. I mean, if you if you have questions now is definitely the time. Um, I'll give you a second to think about it. And I'll make I'll make my, my own pitch, which is that uh, just like like Randy referenced, uh, we used to have in person meetings, and for the past two years we've had virtual annual meetings. Um, this most recent year, uh, we were supposed to be in Long Beach, California, and instead we were, you know, in our seats in our offices. But that being said, the upshot of a virtual event means that just because it ends doesn't mean it's really over. And if you're still interested in being able to see so, of any of the several hundred presentations that were there, and uh, I can't remember exactly how many recorded events that we had uh, but it's like well into the hundreds, the, you can actually still register for the meeting. And uh, if you're an ESA member, it's actually pretty affordable. So uh, you can find out about that, go to esa.org um, period, it's still on the homepage uh, or esa.org slash Long Beach. And you should be able to get yourself in, into that. If you still wanna check out the info, uh, I will just, will just caution you that the, lot, the, the asynchronous Q and A feature hit, is now unfortunately turned off. So you can no longer engage with the authors about their work, but you can see their presentations and you can download their stuff if you want to. Okay, pitch over. <laughs> Did anybody have any, any other uh, questions or anything? Yeah, so um, I wanna, wanna address a question from Henry Bastian, um, who's actually probably on fire. So Henry probably wants to have you answer this for fun. But, um, so there was a Landfire National Base data set that was delivered, you know, it represented conditions on the ground, you know, years ago. And every two years, Landfire would, well, Landfire would um, refresh that data. That is, they would take new disturbance data and remodel what was on the pick on it. Re remodel the labels for the pixels based on disturbance data. And they did that multiple times. They refreshed the data. Then in 20, for 2016, Landfire did a whole new remap where they, they, they didn't refresh the old data. They made a whole new set of base data sets using the latest um, imagery processing, tons more images, uh, latest satellite imagery. And so, um, there are technological changes that were made to the data sets. Um, also, there was tons of review of the legends. Um, so be aware of that. So if you are trying to compare um, existing vegetation type from 2016 to maybe 2012, there may be some differences in legends. Um, usually I think this is an improvement um, based on user feedback, but it can make it harder to compare versions. Also, um, we, we, we asked you guys for help and we got help reviewing roughly 350-ish of the state and transition models, 350 of the 900. So many of those are updated with new literature, updated quantitative parameters that went into the models. So um, I, I see some people on, the, on the, the participants who actively helped us with that. So thank you to ESA and members who are here 
those are the first things that come to mind um though if they're like corey i wonder you know if you wanted to pitch in or others um because it is a great question i mean the versions are different and it's good to be aware of that corey you hopped on high yeah, I think you hit the highlights. One other thing that comes to mind that people might be interested in that was a major change in 2016 is that for existing vegetation type and cover, Landfire now delivers a continuous legend. And so you see height for forests in one meter breaks, um, I think it is, and cover in 1% breaks from one to 100. Uh, previously, we delivered the height and cover in bend, bend classes. So you could get height from zero to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, et cetera. But now um, with that, those continuous data, you could choose your own breaks or classes that work for you. Maybe you need a woodland break at 25%, for example, and you can specify that um, now with the continuous height and cover data. Great call, Corey. That that's, that's a really important one because that, that will impact your processing and how you work with the data. Um, give you a lot more flexibility and a little bit more work if you need to do the binning yourself. So good catch. Um, so we have a question about a link to the state and transition models. And Megan, I was going to put the link in, but I'm guessing maybe you covered that. So um, thank you for that. Okay, so... There's a question, do you ever create intermediate updates to the base land fire file for data from other sources? Um, great question, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't see the timing on your question. Um, basically, yes, the answer is definitely. So there will be, um, we have land fire 2016, which is sort of our, our new base data set, our new reference, our new, um, set of labels for all the pixels. And then when we get disturbance information from users or from remote sensing, we will um, relabel those pixels. For example, if you have an existing vegetation type data from 2016, you have a ponderosa pine forest for a pixel. And the next year we're submitted data that says there was a clear cut there. In the next version of the existing vegetation type data, that would probably be relabeled as recently logged herbaceous or something like that. So the answer is yes, we definitely do that. And um, great question, great question. Um, Aaron Iverson asked a great question, all great questions, thank you. Can you share if and how Landfire uses any other base data sets to build from such as NLCD or others? I'm hoping that um, Corey, Frank, Henry, or others will kick in on this. Um, but what I'm going to say is definitely. So we get our agricultural data, for example, from the National Agricultural Statistics Service, I believe it is. You know, we stamp that in. So we are not actively mapping agriculture. And I think Henry or Frank, if they want, they could kick in in the chat or verbally and talk about how um, we do have a partnership with NLCD. Um, so the answer is definitely yes. And I, I don't know all the specifics on how they all play together, but um, definitely the answer is yes. I could chime in with just a couple other examples. Um, Landfire leans heavily on the wildfire severity mapping mm -hmm. programs like modeling trends and burn severity. And that has helped us um, update our products over time for where there have been recent wildfires. So that's another big example. Um, I think you hit the big one with the, the NAS data. Um, we use some in, in National Wetlands Inventory, NWI data, um, and, the, and of course the NLCD is a big one. Also, I, I just call attention to um, in a, in a chat and well, answer by Tim Hatton, who's with with land fire. Um, so thanks, Tim, and thanks, Corey. Definitely, definitely. Also, um, one more thing that comes to mind, just thinking more about this, is besides spatial data sets that we use, we do rely on inventory data. So we get plot data from FIA, Forest Inventory and Analysis. 
We have an agreement to get the AIMS um, inventory and modeling data from the Department of Interior agencies. We heavily mine the U.S. Forest Service facts database to find out what kind of um, management is being done. So areas that have been thinned or logged or something like that. Um, so um, we rely heavily um, on partner data sets to, to verify our um, image classification. I'm gonna also say um, that we did not include slides on how we've used Landfire in teaching. We didn't know how the timing would be, but I wanted to just call your attention to that. Um, We've worked in high schools. We worked with undergraduate students, graduate students. Um, one of my favorite stories is going into um, a, a advanced raster processing class at Northern Arizona University and helping them basically develop almost a capstone project where they they looked at all the land fire data sets and then started generating questions. Um, this was with, with Mark Minoni at Northern Arizona University. So that was really fun just to see students mash together data sets, explore things on their own. We've also done multiple workshops using the state and transition models as a way to help students understand ecosystems, right? Like understand the succession classes, what succession means, what disturbances do, and how, you know, in modeling space, you can turn off fire or you could advance fire. You could throw in logging or more logging or different types of logging. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, to bring that to your attention as well. We, we love opportunities to work with students and, and professors in a teaching realm as well. And if that interests you, um, feel free to email, reach out to Randy or um, me, and we'd love to sort of talk about that into the future. 